So joining me now from Jerusalem is Holly Dagres. She's a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Middle East Security Initiative. In Lahore, we have journalist Kaniz Fatima. And in Washington, D.C., independent cybersecurity analyst Nima Fatemi. I thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. Holly, let me start with you. The Iranian government wants to ban Instagram. Tell me why they want to do it and why now? Well, this is actually something that surprised a lot of us um, right now, a year after the December 2017, um, January 2018 Iran protest. Um, uh, what we've been seeing for the past year is that ever since the ban on Telegram in April 2018, a lot of Iranians have been using VPNs to access Telegram, which is one of the more popular messaging apps with about over 40 to 56 million users. But because of the ban, it's also become more problematic for Iranians to access it. So they've been actually resorting to Instagram. What have they been using Instagram for? They've been using it for doing advertisements, whether it's for selling clothes, teeth whitening products. But they've also been using it to become Instagram famous or Insta famous by posting parody videos, um, modeling pictures, uh, I would say, uh, along the lines of jokes, even jokes about the clerical establishment. Mm -hmm. But over the course of this past year, we've also seen that these Instagram accounts, in, um, some which range from 300 to half a million users, are also now posting protest videos and a lot of criticism of the Iranian government, including the Aghaz, the children of the elite, where you find that these Iranian government officials' children are posting uh, Thing, personal things like um, their wedding. Uh, right. The Iranian ambassador um, to Denmark's um, daughter-in-law posted videos of a wedding that they, she recently had with their son. And this wedding costs a lot more than it would cost for the average Iranian. And there was a lot of criticism about it. We've right. seen um, Iranian government officials um, posting their outfits, their designer yeah, clothes. And let's just hold that for, for just a second, Holly, because, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point, right? Because a lot of people look back to the late 70s and one of the reasons for the revolution was the inequality, right? So that's fascinating. But uh, Nima Fatemi, let's, let me ask you the very basic technical question. If people can get a VPN, why do they even bother? Is it actually going to work? Yes. Yeah, so when we look at it, uh, to me, it's actually not a new trend that Iran has decided to, to block a, another social media um, app. Basically, for as long as my generation has lived and remember, Iran has been always trying to gatekeep uh, the, the info access to information, basically to flow of information. So this is yet another thing, right? The thing is, like it, we, we also saw this happening when they blocked Telegram, right? So when they blocked te Telegram, a lot of people started using proxies and whatnot. So what Iran did, they actually started developing some of the uh, some some basic clients of Telegram in which that they were not banned, like such as Golden Telegram or Telegram Talai or Hotgram. And these apps were basically essentially used to monitor and censor censor the content that were basically flowing around uh, in the Telegram channel. So from what I see. This is a matter of uh, gatekeeping that information and making sure that that information, how, like, basically looking at, at how information is being flowing around and having access to control and, and monitor and surveil mm -hmm. people as they are uh, using the social medias. Um, like, for instance, when you basically try to uh, search for a VPN in Iran, uh, when when you use Google, when you when you search in Farsi, and the first few. Um, the first few search results that you get are basically uh, not uh, censored in Iran, and you can go in there and use your Iranian bank account to actually purchase a VPN that right. actually works. And it makes me wonder who is managing those VPN <laughs> servers, right? Because right. Uh, when you manage those VPN servers, you can basically have <laughs> access to the traffic of the users. And uh, the other thing that is, right. I think is very, very important to look at is the economy of censorship, right? right. So when you look at it, uh, with the new laws that they've been passing, uh, basically they 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 get users in Iran right now. I I Iranian users, when they when they uh, subscribe for internet access, they have to purchase internet uh, based on the speed limit and also the volume limit, which is not usual around the world. That if you uh, if you download like two movies or like watch too many videos on internet, you you are already being penalized. And right. then there is another thing that has been added that uh, they, the Iranian uh, system has decided that 
if you use any services or any any like basically access any servers that are not inside inside Iran, excuse me, uh, you are again penalized. You have to uh, pay double right. uh, to access those. Like okay. for for any like for any megabytes, your your each megabyte basically is uh, is is considered two megabytes, right? Yeah. And then when you use like these services, you basically essentially pay more to access the same things that you were accessing before. So essentially, I think this is aimed aimed to uh, to to the working class and the lower middle class because uh, those are the, the only people who can't afford uh, to pay the extra amount Understood. to have access to this information. Uh, yeah, so and th additionally, hold on, hold on, wanna, hold on, just I for wanna, a second. Uh, Nima, just a sec, just a sec, right? Oh, thanks for painting the picture. And of course, also, sure. it's really interesting that you say, you know, sometimes you might need a VPN for your VPN because you don't know who's running it, right? Kenis Fatima, let's big picture look at Instagram because we know the leadership is on Instagram. Hassan Rouhani is on Instagram, more than 2 million followers. Uh, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, if you tally up the Farsi with the English, it's about 2.8 million altogether. At what point did they go, if this is them at all, this is not a good social media application and we don't want it in our country anymore? What was the tipping point? Was there a tipping point where they started to see this as a national security threat? Right. Now, it depends on how you explain or define a national security threat. As you've just mentioned, a lot of the Iranian officials are on Instagram. Anyone who's someone in Iran has an Instagram account. And over the years, as I've noticed, specifically since the filtering of Telegram, we've seen more and more people use Instagram and the different features that it provides, um, be it its uh, questions or its polls or even its um, live uh, broadcasting uh, feature. They've been using it in, in different ways to gain greater audiences. And uh, as your earlier guest pointed out as well, this has created a platform where debates can happen in a very depoliticized way between people on social, economic, and political issues. Now, these movements cannot be um, easily dismissed by calling them foreign infiltration or calling them um, paid agents of the West. These are grassroots movements of average Iranians who have a stake in the future of their country and who continue to profess, a lot many of them, their loyalty to the ideals of the Islamic Revolution. So these aren't outside foreign threats, as, for example, maybe with the filtering of Telegram went, where there was that issue that there are channels on Telegram that are being used by foreign agents to instigate violence and dissent. But on, 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 on Instagram, what you're seeing are grassroots Iranians who are saying that there is a problem with corruption in the country. Right. We don't want a regime change. We just want a system of governance which represents our values mm -hmm. and that looks out for us. So therein lies that problem where the Iranian um, authorities, or as I would call them, the old guard, the the, the um, politicians who have been in power for decades now and have sort of uh, been looking towards remaining in power and, and using those, uh, those positions of strength for their own personal gains, these movements and the platform that Instagram provides them and the questions that then come up uh, is a threat for them. Okay. It uh, becomes so me... then a, ma a matter of national security right. for them. Okay, so to them that is, the mere discussion is a threat national security threat rather than actual mobilization. Interesting distinction being made there and interesting to see that from their perspective or to try to guess that from their perspective. Holly Douglas, is it like a game of whack-a-mole where they're gonna push Instagram down but something else will bubble up as a platform for discussion? Is that how it works? Um, I think you essentially hit the nail on the head and I'll explain why. Um, before Telegram was a thing, it was Viber. And before it was Viber, it was WhatsApp. So um, with Iranians, historically speaking, whether it's something of a social media or a messaging application or day-to-day, -day, um, they figured out when, when there's a will, there's a way. If Iranians find that they can't use certain applications, they're going to find another one that's not being filtered, or they'll just resort to using VPNs, which is what they've been doing for years with Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube since the 2009 post-election protest known as the Green Movement. So I think for Iranians, this is merely an obstacle, and they will always find a way around this obstacle. Two final comments from both Nima and Kaniz. Nima? 
like maybe this is this is the, the point that they, they started to actually uh, look into blocking uh, these social medias is that just like how uh, how our um, other fellow panelists mentioned that like all these government officials have been using uh, all these social medias like you look at how many of them are actually actively using mm -hmm. uh, Twitter for example which has been blocked since 2009 like the Supreme leader himself has like two verified accounts in Farsi and English and uh, they continue to tweet in in different languages so I think what's happening here is that they they want to control the flow of information and like what what like that's like one part of it that they see that uh, when when even when uh, when we we see that like different different things come up on social media such as like torture of this uh, worker uh, for example Esmail Bakhshi uh, who, which which started to become a trend to a point that they uh, the state media had to cover it and and after that uh, the the parliament had to um, do some sort of like at least they they said that they are going to uh, do uh, basically an investigation to to uh, understand like what was going on which that investigation totally failed and they didn't do it but they like it it it, it forced them to react to that right. uh, to that conversation so I think that's like one of the issues and the other thing is that uh, while all of these these elites basically have unfiltered access to this they they just want to restrict the lower class and the uh, the the working class which is basically taking the bigger hit Right. In the current society, in, in the current current economic uh, econo uh, economy of the country and uh, and in the society that we have right now, so I think this is a way of uh, basically controlling the crisis and 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 damage control of of the Islamic Republic as it's basically failing on so many different grounds. So people cannot like they are just basically trying to slow down uh, the the narr narrative of of basically. Uh, the discourse between the people, like we, like as people mentioned, right. which Nima, has gotta, been I've always restricted by the Iranian government. I've got to wrap in less than a minute. Let me get a final, yeah. final comment from Kaniz. Kaniz, very briefly, please. Well, I think it would be interesting to see how the discourse develops. Um, it's not just Instagram. Um, it's about the platform that it provided for conversations to happen, for engagement to take place, because it's quite clear that Iranian viewers are not finding that on their national media or being reflected. Um, amongst government branches uh, that uh, claim to speak for themselves. So it will be interesting to see what tools then will be used to have those conversations and to develop that discourse further, which goes from uh, which goes further from just speaking and engagement towards actual action in bringing out the kind of reforms and political uh, changes that the Iranian people want to see in their system of governance. Okay, Nima Fatimi. Holly Dagres and Kanis Fatima for the moment. I've got to move on. Thank you very much for joining us.